This is a very familiar passage of Scripture, and I'd love for you just to bow your heads and close your eyes as we begin our worship experience together. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Our gracious and heavenly Father, sometimes we read these passages or we hear them and we've heard it hundreds of times. And yet when we stop and pay attention to every word in that particular verse, for God so loved the world, you sent your Son into this, into this place, into this time, as a human being the second Adam, and demonstrated what it was to live, what it was to walk in relationship with you perfectly, as an example, as a model, to solve the problem of sin that we talked about back a couple weeks ago, with this incredible invitation that anyone, anywhere, anytime, who recognizes Jesus to be who he is, that we can walk with Him and have this incredible life-giving relationship here on earth which sets us up for this incredible hope and promise of what is to come at our death or at Your return. God, we pray tonight we would grow in our walk with You. That we would grow in our understanding of Your heart. That we would grow in our understanding of committing our life to You. Your care, Your control. And sitting in the weight of that. Sitting in the joy of that. Sitting in the hope of that that we might point others to you through our lives. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen. One of the things that the enemy does that quite often trips me up is he'll remind me of some of the things that I wish I'd never, ever done. And it can come in waves, like I think I'm doing pretty good, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, you... And, and uh, the times that I've stumbled and struggled with that the most, it can be really debilitating. And one of the things that I'm learning as a Christ follower is the importance of what the Apostle Paul said when he said, hold every thought captive. Hold every thought captive. And uh, in the last week and a half in particular, as the enemy has attacked me in that way, this lyric has gone over and over in my head. And uh, if you want to mask up, we're going to sing this. I don't think I'm the only one that is attacked that way. So we're going to celebrate how great God's mercy is tonight. What love could you remember? No wrongs we have done. Omniscience, all-knowing. He counts not their sum. They're thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Praise the Lord. so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the violest the of kindness he lavished on us 
His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood beneath the debt we could never afford. Oh, our sins, they are many, but His mercy is more.
no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning. The cross before me. The cross before. It is, uh, it's good to be with you. This is week three of Hurts, Habits, and Hangups. And for those of you who have been following along online, it's good to have you as well. Uh, but just to give you a bit of a recap to set the conversation for this evening, week one, we had really worked through Romans chapter seven, which was a conversation around how we don't have the ability to ultimately change the inside of who we are as a human being. We go through all kinds of attempts and efforts and seek great help but it really doesn't do much for the way we live our lives through particular cycles and patterns. And until the human being really lands on this reality, there isn't much movement for them in their life. It's just kind of more of the same as they live through their life. Last week, Pastor Gordon spoke about how uh, we matter to God and spent a lot of time working through John 4, the woman at the well, and kind of shared her story and kind of wove his own story into that and was very powerful when we feel these moments of absolute lost and alone and broken, uh, God often shows up in those very spaces to tell us that we matter to him in a deep, deep way. And he's the one that has the power to ultimately help us change our lives in some significant ways. Tonight, the third principle, you can read it on the screen with me, is this. We consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control where we consciously choose to commit all my life and will to Christ's care and control. Before we begin this conversation tonight, would you pray with me? Our gracious and heavenly Father, it is always a joy to work your, through Your words to us, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, it would shape our lives, that it would bring to bear issues of our life that we have tried to hide from the ones who matter the most to us, and if we're truthful, we've done a very poor job at hiding it. That the Holy Spirit would bring to bear in our lives that despite our inability to change who we are, despite the mess that we've created for ourselves, despite the spaces of sin that we might find ourselves, we still matter to You deeply. In fact, we matter so much to You that while we were still sinners, You sent Your Son to die for us. And God, tonight we pray that through that same power that raised your son from the dead, that you would bring to bear this issue, that we would choose to commit all of my life, all of my will to your care and control. Yes, these things in your name. Amen. Before we get started, some of you 
who are longtime Christ followers might think, oh, this is a, I've heard this before. I've, I've done this. And yet, there are probably corners of our life that we still struggle with, if we're honest, to release and let go and let God really shape our life as it relates to care and control. And I would invite you to lean in and listen well as we work through this third conversation of our hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Today, tonight, we will shift away from the woman at the well story that we have spent some time with the last two weeks. And we want to look at some men who, like the woman at the well, had an encounter with the living God, Jesus Christ. And if we set up camp over their life for a few moments, we get an inside look at this third conversation where we would consciously choose to commit all of our life, all of our will to His care and control. The first gentleman I want to introduce you to is a guy named Matthew. If you don't know him, Matthew is the Gospel writer that you would find in the text of Scripture. Matthew's other name is a guy named Levi. And the first time we ever run into Matthew, we find him in the village that he grew up in in Capernaum. Sitting in his tax booth along one of the main highways as travelers would come and go. There, doing his job, he was collecting taxes. It's kind of the the duty-free shop before there was a duty-free shop. As farmers, as merchants, as caravans brought their goods from other parts of the world to Jerusalem, Matthew there on the road to Capernaum was collecting taxes. It sounds normal. It sounds like an everyday job. But what makes this so awful is that Matthew, as a Jewish man, was working for the Roman Empire. Matthew, as a tax collector, would have paid all of the taxes up front, and then he would go about his business of getting as much as he could from the people, all under the banner as taxes. To give you an example of what this might look like, the Roman Empire would look at a region that they controlled, and based on a census, they would guesstimate, well, how much tax dollars could we get from this particular portion of our, of our world? It would be like Ottawa saying, how much tax dollars could we get from PEI? And then Matthew would say, well, I can pay that amount. So Matthew would pay that money up front to the Roman Empire or up front to Ottawa. No one really knows what that amount is. And then Matthew goes to work to reimburse himself. Well, Matthew has a heart like most. And greed sets in. And with no ability to control what he's doing, he would just collect taxes and take from you ultimately whatever he wanted to do. All under the banner of these are just taxes. Tax collectors were hated by their people. They lived in isolation from pretty much everybody. They were betrayers of their own people, robbing them to pay the Romans. And Matthew Levi is in this world in a very twisted way. And Jesus comes to him. And just invites him to follow him. The second gentleman I'd love to introduce you to is a guy named Nicodemus. Again, if you know your scriptures, Nicodemus is an interesting character. Nicodemus would fall into the category of morally right, and yet at the same time, not entirely satisfied with a system that just really highlighted rules. And if you just obeyed the rules, you were good. There was something more to him but morally sound was a guy named Nicodemus. We first run into him in John chapter 3, but there's no doubt that Nicodemus ran into Jesus and his teaching long before you and I see him in John 3. Nicodemus would have heard him teach in the temple or other places where he went. And Nicodemus, this powerful man, a part of the right group of people of his day, a part of the kind of religious elite the group that set the rules and enforced the rules and kind of watched over individuals as they worshipped and practiced the Jewish law, with this strong, logical mind, with a heart that longs for more than just the morality of things, Nicodemus approaches Jesus at night and gets into a pretty profound conversation about who he is and who he is in response to him. And Jesus, like He does every time, kind of spoke in a way that was clear but yet cryptic. And Nicodemus kind of took the conversation and began to process all that Jesus was saying. And through this conversation, Jesus asks him to be born again. The third character is a guy named Thomas. Thomas is the 
the, the stereotypical doubter or the skeptic. Thomas lived and was from a place called Galilee. And we don't know much about him other than the fact that it took a lot for him to be convinced of things. Like Thomas, the woman, like, sorry, Thomas, like the woman at the well, like Matthew, like Nicodemus, they are all confronted with this invitation to follow Jesus, to be born again, or to drink from the living water as last week. This is this crucial moment that sets us up for the conversation of this third principle. This moment where one would choose to commit their life to God, believing that God cares for them and that He is in control of all things. Matthew, Nicodemus, Thomas, along with the woman at the well from last week, each of them and countless of others for the past 2,000 years have been choosing to, to commit their lives to God. Now, here's what this doesn't mean. Because there is an awful lot of conversation about what it means to commit their life to God. You hear it online all the time. You hear it in other churches all over the globe. But what it doesn't mean that if someone commits their life to God or they decide to follow Jesus, it doesn't mean that our life is going to be free of struggle. It doesn't mean that it's going to be absent of pain or failure. It doesn't mean that my life, while I live on this earth, that it's going to be void of brokenness and turmoil. Some of you in this room, some of you listening online, your life already is a testimony to that, where you have faithfully followed Jesus for years, and you know that it's filled with just the brokenness of the world, turmoil that you didn't ask for, situations that you find yourself in, sicknesses on the other side of a phone call that you didn't see coming. Following Jesus, believing in God, does not mean those things are removed from our lives. In fact, in a moment, sometimes that's when He does His best work in us, which is where we find our deepest comfort in His care and control when the world begins to bear down on us. I do want to share with you what it does mean. When someone commits their life to God's care and control, when we follow Him, I will get to move through and past the hurts and habits that have plagued my life as I learn to follow Jesus. We'll talk very clearly about this in week five and week six. I will get to experience His personal care over my life as I get to know Him. As I walk along Brackley beaches, as Pastor Gordon shared last week, I will get to walk in the comfort and hope, knowing that God is at work in my life, regardless of the situations that I would find myself in. To say this another way, Matthew, Nicodemus, Thomas, the woman at the well, and thousands of others through the course of time, by choosing to commit their lives to God, Number one, it, it meant they grew tired of the life that they had built for themselves, knowing that they had no ability to control it. This was week one. They also realized that despite all their deep issues, Nicodemus, the woman at the well, Matthew, Thomas, you, me, despite all their deep issues, that they deeply mattered to God, that they were still invited in to follow and have a living relationship with the Creator of the world. Not only were they invited in and that they matter to Him, that He is the one who offers power to help. This was week two. And each of these men and women from last week, they wanted to experience this. They wanted to experience a type of care, a type of life that was deeply different from the one that they had built for themselves. I don't think any one of these characters would have set out with this in mind. But here they are, confronted with this incredible opportunity, knowing that they matter to God, knowing that He's confronted them in the most caring, compassionate way, and yet on point to who they are. And they're invited to commit and follow Him. This is where this conversation gets incredibly exciting for me. Matthew, Nicodemus, Thomas, the woman at the well... Let me all tell you a little about them after 
they decided to follow and commit their life to Jesus Christ. The woman at the well last week, if you haven't heard it yet, the woman at the well was an estranged outsider to her whole village. And the moment she begins to follow Jesus, she's restored to her village. They believe her. She runs back and she tells them of this man that knew everything about her, and they run out to see him. They invite Jesus back, and for two days, he spends time with them. And many in her village come to know and walk with the living God all through this woman's testimony who they wouldn't have had any time for several days before. Everything in her hometown gets turned upside down all because of what God does through her life. Matthew, Levi, this greedy, crooked tax collector who lives in isolation from his Jewish friends and family, Matthew ultimately leaves this life of wealth and security and power and becomes a person who is devoted to telling others about who Jesus Christ is. The moment he begins to follow Jesus, we read in the Gospels that Matthew throws a farewell party, a feast in his home in the village of Capernaum, and he invites every other tax collector. Hey, your life sucks like mine. You should meet this guy. And they all come. And this is the moment when the Pharisees see Jesus sitting with tax collectors and they scorn him. They scoff at who is this man that sits and eats with tax collectors? Matthew is one of the ones who becomes the famous 12 disciples. He's immersed in meaningful relationships with other people, men and women. Fifteen years later, we read through church history that Matthew's life, his life is taken from him in Ethiopia while telling others about Jesus Christ, living in complete abandonment to who he now is. And Nicodemus, this rational, this seeker, this smart, this intellectual guy, after he becomes born again, after this moment in John 3, Nicodemus is the one who is found advocating for Jesus to have a fair trial when he's arrested. It is tough to stand up for the right thing in the moment all of your peers are asking you to do the wrong thing. Nicodemus is the one who cares for Jesus' body after he's killed. He's the one who becomes incredibly generous with his wealth when he offers, when he gives up 75 pounds to, to preserve and prepare Jesus' body in myrrh. Nicodemus is a man who is an incredible example of faith and courage in moments of difficult spots. Thomas. I love Thomas. In some ways, I'm a Thomas. I, I love the question why, and I do not like the fact that some of my children carry that same trait. Why? Well, just because I said so today. Tomorrow I'll have time to answer it. But Thomas was the one who says it's okay to ask these questions. He's the one that shows us that it's okay to ask for evidence. He's the one who said, unless I see the nail marks in your hands or put my finger where the nails were or put my hands into your side, I will not believe you. And Jesus responds and says, here. Here. Feel away. I am the one, Thomas. Thomas, again, church history, tells us that he is killed for his great faith later in his life. Again, rooted in his commitment and faith in Jesus, the one who is caring for him. The text of Scripture, the last 2,000 years of human history, speaks to millions of men and women who were invited to follow Jesus and they responded. They were invited to be born again. They were invited to commit their lives to Him. And after they made this decision, they experienced many amazing things. Everything from forgiveness and freedom from their sinful habits. Restoration from the hurts that they've carried through their entire life. Power to live and experience life in a different, better way. Sometimes we don't stop and take the time and read about the kind of care 
that we are on the receiving end of when we walk with Him. To finish out our time here this evening, I want to put some passages up on the screen and just talk about them a little bit. Because it is amazing that we get to experience forgiveness and freedom. Those are incredible things. It's amazing that we get to experience this being restored from hurts in our life. It's amazing to be filled with a power that is not of this world through the Holy Spirit to experience life done differently. But I also get to experience the care of God over my life. In Psalm 8, we, or I spoke of this back in the summer in our prayer series. And I want to read this passage to you as the first one. When I look at the night sky and I see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. You made them only a little lower than God. It, it never ceases to amaze me. When I'm outside where we live, or back in the woods, or wherever I go, that when I stop and consider the heavens, the moon and the stars that you have set in place, who am I that you know my name and you care for me? I loved Gordon's story last week, kind of on the beach, like given all that's going on in the world, on a beach in Brackley, in the woods in Albert County in New Brunswick, on your back patio or wherever you may be, when you consider all that's been made, He cares for you. He knows your name. He's beckoning and calling, inviting us in to something unique and special. Romans 8. We know, this one is just amazing, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. And I want to spend a moment here on this text. When someone decides to follow Jesus, when someone decides to commit their life to God, what we are after or what we are pursuing or what we are becoming is that we are being conformed to the image of His Son. That we take on the very likeness and spirit and personality that we see in Christ Himself. That when someone, when they're 19, if they make a decision to follow Jesus, that they are becoming more gentle in time. They're becoming more compassionate, full of grace and mercy. That their, that their arms are kind of wide open to welcome in people into their life. That they have rich meaning for relationships because this is what we see in and through the work and person of Jesus. And as a Christ follower, now at 42, it amazes me some of the situations that I have found myself in, some that I did not ask for, and some that were my fault. And in every single situation, somehow, in those moments, I know that God is at work for my good to conform me to become like Him. That's a unique kind of care. That even in situations that I didn't ask for, you're there at work doing something to shape my life that it becomes better in time. And where it really blows my mind when I am the reason for why my life is a mess at the moment. You're at work to bring about something in me that's unique and special that is becoming more and more like Christ. It is an intimate type of care in my life. And for those who follow Christ, Isaiah 41.10, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Do not fear, for I am with you. This is a conversation that we have all the time with our kids. No need to be afraid. Someone walks with you. Someone is going ahead of you. Someone is giving you all that you need in these moments of life. 
Isaiah 43, 2. This one's good. And notice how it reads, when you, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, it's not if, it's when. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. When you find yourself in these spaces, the living God is with you, present to you, working for you, that He might receive glory in the middle of your life. 1 Peter 5. This is the last one. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Nicodemus, Matthew, the one at the well, Thomas, they experienced these passages in their life. Many in this room, many of you listening online, you've, you experience this on an ongoing basis in your life. For you here this evening, for the one listening at home, people have been making this decision for 2,000 years to commit their life to God for His care under His control. And it changes their life. I love how Matthew and all of the Gospels kind of speak to these first three principles wrapped up in this passage that I've kind of translated it for this conversation. When you're ready to lose your life, when you're ready to come to the grips and the reality that you can't control your life, when you're ready to believe that you matter to God and that He loves you, when you're ready to consciously choose to commit all of your life and will to Christ's care and control, you will then and only then find life. If you just read it from the text of Scripture, it would read, when you're ready to lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. When you're ready to lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. Tonight, I know that most of you in this room, many of you listening online, you have made this decision long ago. Some when you were little, some when you were kind of late teens, early 20s, some in this room, I know it was much later than that. And you can speak to this in your own personal story. And I would encourage you to share your personal story with the ones who matter most to you. Speak of God's care over your life. How He's walked with you in these moments, these seasons of your life. And yet I know there's people in this room and there's many listening online where they have never really made this decision. They've never chosen to commit their life to God. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that this evening. I'd invite you just to close your eyes and bow your heads and I'm going to pray this evening to kind of bring our time to an end. And if you're someone here that you're in this space of kind of week one, week two, that you recognize that you can't kind of change ultimately where your life's been headed and that you've come to land in the space that despite you, God loves you and you matter to Him, well, I want to invite you to commit your life to His care and control. Would you pray with me? Our gracious and heavenly Father, when I think about the people that, that you invite in, it's just, it's just amazing. Go way back, Abraham, son of an idol maker. You call him. Rahab, a prostitute, not a part of your people. You invite her in. You go down through the text of Scripture into the New Testament and you see the same. You invite guys like Saul. Women like the woman at the well the woman who was caught in adultery, any one of the disciples you call and invite, 
And that invitation still stands over our life. It is your hope, it is your desire that all men and women would know you and walk with you. But we decide to follow. We make this decision to say, I'm going to live my life differently. I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. I don't know what that entirely means right now, but inside my heart of hearts, I'm going to do this. And God does something remarkable inside of us. He changes our heart. He does the the one thing to us and for us that we cannot do for ourselves. He places His Spirit deep inside and it begins to grow. And in time, we are conformed to the image of Christ. We get to experience life and life to its full here in this great hope of what is to come at our death. That hurts and habits and hang-ups that we've carried our entire life can once and for all be finally put to death for the glory of Your wonderful name that we would bear witness to Your might and power in our life. God, it's my prayer that if there's anyone here in this room this evening, we would make this decision that we would move in this way. Listening online, the same thing. And if you've made this decision, we would invite you to get to know Christ, His people. In your name we pray. Amen. We can lay down our burdens and lay down your shame. All, all who are broken, lift up your face. A wanderer, come home. You're never too far. Isn't that awesome? And lay down our hurt, lay down our heart, come as we are. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been, come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come kneel, cause earth has no sorrow that Jesus can heal. Earth has no sorrow that Jesus can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All, all who are broken, lift up your face, a wanderer. this line. There's hope. There's hope for the hopeless. All those who strayed sit at His table and taste of God's grace. Rest for the weary. Rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that Jesus can't cure. Earth has no sorrow that Jesus can't cure. So lay down your Lay down.